know, uh, there's people that think that they sin so much they can't get forgiven. And uh, that's not true. When Jesus died on Calvary, he paid for all the sins. All. And uh, David sinned. And he sinned more than what he thought he was going to sin because he had to cover up the first one to make forgiveness. Do another one to do that. So he wrote Psalm 51, which was his confession and how bad he felt about it. And then he wrote Psalm 32 to tell how great he felt because God forgave all his sins. So he, adultery and murder. And I don't know what else he did, but I'm going to read from Psalm 32. He says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven. And they may, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord as clear of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. He's under conviction, wasn't he? Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may, be, may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and a bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey Him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Thank the Lord that we... Because of what Jesus did on Calvary, we are free from all our sin and guilt. Thank the Lord. Let's remember.
you would like to know the future, and sometimes you wouldn't like to know the future. Many times it's the goodness of God that we don't know the future. Uh, if we had known what all we were getting into, in certain cases, we probably would never have started. And yet, in many times in those cases, as we look back on it, even through what we go through, to get to the place where we would say, if I'd known this was going to happen before I started, I would never have started here. But if you persevere long enough, then later on you say, well, I'm glad it happened. Yeah. I'm glad I got put into that place. I got, I'm glad I got moved out of my comfort zone and moved into a greater area of ministry where God has taken me. I want to look at this verse uh, here in John, uh, Jeremiah chapter 21. And it's verse 8. And it says, See, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Now you're thinking, okay, well that's a standard verse that we could use for a salvation message. But actually, as you look at the context of this in this chapter, you'll see, we'll look at it historically, how it fit here in the history at the time of Jeremiah. We'll look at some of the uh, parallels to today to the, to the warnings for today. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Possible warnings he's giving us for today. And then sometimes you have a, a process of uh, reasoning that you can do. Uh, you have one where you can take a general experience, like sin is bad, and then you can come down and name a particular sin, and you can say that particular sin is bad, because sin is bad. Now you have to be careful trying to go the other direction. Sometimes you can name a particular thing and try to draw a generalization out of that. And many times you can do that, and many times that's legitimate, but sometimes you make a mistake going from this direction to this direction. You can't do that. It's like, what is it? Uh, all raisins are grapes, but not all grapes are raisins. Right. So if you take a raisin, if you say all raisins are grapes, and uh, then you have a raisin which is part of that grape thing, dried grape, then you can say it's a grape. But you will not say that all grapes are raisins because they're not all dried. So, Okay, so this passage here, this verse, it says, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Talks about what he's talking about there in Jeremiah's day. It gives us a warning for what's going on today. And then I really believe that we're safe in this case in drawing it out into the broader aspect of the way of life and death having to do with eternal life and e eternal death. Because there's enough scripture that says that that's true whether you draw it directly from it here. Does that make sense? Okay, so we'll go in all those directions here this morning. Now, the first one was in Jeremiah's day. And back in chapter 21, you had Jeremiah and a, na a man named Pasher that had a little bit of a conflict. Actually, it's a big conflict. Uh, Pasher actually struck Jeremiah. He captured him. He put him in the stocks overnight. And so they had already had some dealings with each other. I don't, I guess maybe the king did not know about this. King Zedekiah, it was, because he told Pasher, I want you to go to the prophet Jeremiah and ask him to inquire of the Lord for us. And so that's where we are. So. Jeremiah and Pasher have already had some dealings, so there's not good blood between them to begin with. Zedekiah is wanting to know from Jeremiah what's going to happen. He wants to know about the way. Zedekiah knows that King Nebuchadnezzar is bringing an army, and it's going to come against them. And, uh, well, 
God has warned people time and time again, if you will follow me, I will bless you. If you will follow me, I will protect you. But if you decide to not follow me, then the deal is off. <laughs> God doesn't speak like that, but I do. <laughs> and he said, it's off. It's off. And so that's what had happened. The land of Judah and Israel. Israel had already been captured and taken off into captivity. And so these prophets that are prophesying to the southern kingdom, like Jeremiah, said it's already happened to our neighbors to the north. And if we don't repent, it can happen to us too. And it looks like it's about to happen. And so Zedekiah realizes that King Nebuchadnezzar is coming against them. And he sends Pasher to Jeremiah to hopefully get some hope, <laughs> hopefully get some good news, where God is going to say, okay, I want to protect you just like I did Gideon, whenever he had too many people and just narrowed it down, you know, and we'd have the victory that way. And the Zedekiah would hope that maybe Jeremiah was going to send word back and say, well, it'll be like this. Like, you remember when you did Jericho? You just marched around it. <laughs> He's hopeful for that. But Jeremiah's only going to speak what the Lord gives him to speak. And so it's not really good news. Let's read it here. Jeremiah chapter 21. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pasher, the son of Melchijah, and Zephaniah, the son of Maaseah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is making war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all of his wondrous works. That's a good one to underline in your Bible. Lots of times we praise the Lord for his wondrous works. And so he's seen the wondrous works before. And they're hopeful of those wondrous works again. Maybe the Lord will do that. Perhaps he will deal with us according to all his wondrous works so that the enemy withdraws from us. So Pasher has done what Zedekiah asked, and Jeremiah is going to answer. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands with which you fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls. And I will assemble them into the midst of this city. Doesn't sound like good news, does it? going to be worse though. It would be bad enough for them to be fighting against the army of Nebuchadnezzar but hear what the Lord says. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched arm or with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm. Even in anger and in fury and in great wrath I will instruct the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They will die of a great pestilence. So a great pestilence, a great pandemic comes upon them. That's what he's saying to them. There will be a great pestilence. That will kill off many of them. Afterwards, says the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people and such as are left in this city from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of those who seek their life. And he will strike them with the edge of the sword. He will not spare them or have pity or mercy. So the king has the hopes that God is going to display his wondrous works against his enemies. But God says, no, it's going to be worse. In fact, I will fight against you myself 
I'm going to strike the people with pestilence, and those that die from pestilence, don't die from pestilence, are going to be killed by the sword. Well, that's the context of what we're dealing with here. He will, and I'm down at verse 7, and he will strike them with the edge of the sword. He will not spare them or have pity or mercy. To this people you shall say, thus says the Lord, See, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Well, just taking that verse by itself, I just think of here is the way of salvation and here is the way of of not salvation, of being lost. But in the context of this, he's talking about the way of life is that they're going to be thrown into captivity. They're not going to be able to govern themselves. Someone else is going to govern them. And if they want to live, they're going to have to accept that that's going to come. And the only way that they're going to live is to go outside of the city and surrender to King Nebuchadnezzar and his army. Otherwise, they will have the pestilence and they will be struck by the sword. Verse 9, who abide, he who abides in the city will die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But he who goes out and falls away to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he will live. And he will have his own life as booty. For I have set my face against this city for disaster and not for good, says the Lord. It will be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it with fire. And then he comes in giving a message to the house of David. Concerning the house of the king of Judah, which again is Zedekiah, hear the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus says the Lord. Now here's where they could have turned things around. Here's where they could have escaped uh, this judgment from God coming upon them. So he says this, Execute justice each morning, and deliver him who has been robbed from the hand of the oppressor. Let my fury go out like fire and burn, so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your deeds. See, I'm, I am against you, O inhabitant of the valley, O rocky plain, says the Lord. You men who say, Who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter our dwellings? But I will punish you according to the fruit of your deeds, says the Lord, and I will kinder a fire in the forest, and it will devour all things around it. Well, there's the message for Judah. It is that uh, God has told them, I've told you time and time again you need to repent, and you haven't done it. And I've told you to execute justice, and you haven't done that. And he's telling us, get a little glimmer here, and he's telling them to execute justice every morning, that if you do that, then there might be hope. It might come back around. Now walk down here, can you hear me? No. Okay. Charlie, you want to try going up a little bit or not? Are you turned on? It's, it's on. Okay. Well, anyway, so he comes down there and he says, uh, I told you and I want you to repent and all of that. Okay, I'm going to use the other mic. We're going to keep working with this, and we're going to get to work someday. Because I want to get back to my comfortable place, and where I can walk around a little bit. Because <laughs> I just, that's just me. Uh, a little more comfortable doing that. All right, so, he told them to repent, they didn't do it, now judgment's going to come. They don't know it. We know it because we have the whole Old Testament. We can read about it where they are going to go into captivity. It's going to happen for 70 years. 
Now, the way is set before us. Choose the way. Choose the way of life or the way of death. Can judgment come upon us? He said, those of you that feel uh, like you're secure, all wrapped up in this city, nope, not going to work. Pestilence is going to come and the sword is going to come and you're going to be take cap taken captive. So we have that and we live in the greatest nation that has ever been. We lived in the strongest nation of the world, world power. We don't know what it's like to be in captivity by another country, another nation. We don't know what that's like. And we might feel just like these people that uh, nothing can come against us. Well, that's not true, folks. I mean, something can come against us. It really can happen. And I hope it doesn't. And I hope that wondrous works that he talks about there is what we see and all be displayed. But uh, um, there were the people over in Europe. They felt like that they were probably in pretty good shape. World War I came along. And then somebody in that area came up with an idea, came up with a philosophy, came up with the idea of let's share the wealth, which that sounds good on the surface. But they started taking it to an extreme. People started losing their property. And they started, and it did help some people, help some people whenever they did that. But they started doing that. And anyway, it came to a philosophy that was called communism. And uh, then you came along, uh, it started growing there in, in Europe. And uh, you had one state that was, it titled itself as a socialist state. And then you had a group of states, it's called the USSR, United Socialist States, or something. Anyway, United, a bunch of socialist states. I don't know if Russia is the R or not or not. But Russia was one of them. So you had that happen. So, in the Old Testament, they went into captivity for 70 years. Over in Europe, they tried this great experiment because there's a way that seems right unto the man, and it was called communism. And it lasted for 70 years after World War I, around 1919, 1920 or so. And then in 1991, I think it was, the communist flag over Russia came down, and they put up the one they have now. What happened was it collapsed. It came down. It was an experiment. It didn't work. And it hurt a lot of people. And uh, we need to be careful that we don't go the same direction. And so I just, I just warn us about that as Americans. That's coming along. And it can happen. Well, over in Germany, uh, there was a, one particular family and uh, this man, I forget what his job was, but in his office, he had a picture of Jesus that came up. Well, communism and Nazism was trying to make its way into Germany. And it hadn't happened yet, but that picture was up there. And people started coming and restricting their freedoms. And they came to this man, and they said, you've got to take that picture down. And he said, I'm not going to. And they said, if you don't take it down, you're going to be demoted. And he didn't take it down. And there were two other times that they tried to get him to take that picture down, and they would not, he would not do it. Well, then he had a son, and that son had children, and so he had his son and his family. Well, they decided to live on different sides of Berlin. And that's somewhere in the 1940s, the Berlin Wall was put, put up. So you had the man who had the picture of Jesus still over his desk, but the rest of his family was on this side and the wall was up. And this was where communism came in. It was taking over that part. This is 
after World War II, which you've already dealt with Nazism and all of that. And uh, of course, Germany had gone through all of that. And so over on this side, or would that be right with you looking at it? West, which way looks west? Is this west for you? That would be west, huh? If that was north, which way would be west for you? <laughs> okay, well, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, over in East Germany, you had communism that was coming in. Nazism had already happened. And uh, anyway, so here was this man. Here was his son. And he was working in a particular place, and he had a cross because he also was a pastor. And when he came into his job one day, they said, you will have to take that cross off. And he said, well, why do I have to take that cross off? And he said, because you can't wear anything personal here. And so he went back home and he came back the next day. And he said, well, I notice all of you have these little pins here that are a sign of communism. He said, I'll take my cross off if you'll take your pins off. So they allowed him to wear his cross. Because they didn't want to take their pins off. Well, then you had the sun. And uh, uh, children, but the one son, the one that was telling the story. And so whenever he got in school, everybody had the chance to become a part of the communist youth. But he would not do it. So whenever they had school get-togethers and things like this, the communist youth would get up and they would do the program and there would be these few that were not part of the club they would still have to be up front because they're part of the school, but they're off to the side. They're excluded. Well, that happened in grade school. And then he got up in high school. They had another program, another honor society, and uh, he was excluded. He was off to the side because he would not join. And he was going to come up, coming out into the workforce, and it's probably going to be even more pressure. But... They were deciding not to do it. Well, when he was a teenager, this grandfather who had the picture of Jesus was going to have a birthday. And uh, so his family went down to the police and they asked for permission to go to West Germany. West Germany. Asked for permission to go to West Germany. And... Uh, the people in the police station, they just laughed at him. It said, now some walls are to keep evil from coming into your country, but ours are to keep our people from not going anywhere else. And you're not going to get out. Nobody ever gets to do that. Well, they filled out the paperwork and left it on the desk, and they went home, and they prayed. And a few days later, they got the call and said, your petition has been denied. Then there was going to be the birthday party for the grandmother. A year or two later, they went down to the police station. They petitioned again. The police just laughed at them. They went home. They got the call, and you have been denied. Then the grandmother and grandfather were going to have a wedding anniversary. And... Uh, they all went down to the police station again, and they filled out the paperwork, and they just laughed at them, and they left it laying on the desk there. And went back home. The children are saying, well, why, don't, why do we allow this, and what can we do, and all this? And, and uh, the dad said, well, we just pray. And they prayed. And they got a call, and it said, your petition has been granted. And so they went down to the police station to pick up the paperwork, and somebody said, I don't know. I don't know who you know in higher places, but for some reason, you have permission to go. And uh, they just couldn't believe it. And so they gave them the papers. And so they went over to the border. 
And the border guards couldn't believe it, so nobody ever gets to do this, especially family. And the family had said, if you let us go, we'll be over there for a week, and then we'll turn around, and we will come back. We promise that we will do that. Well, they didn't believe them, but they gave them the papers. And so they went out and went to the wedding anniversary. They had a great time. And then it was time to go back. They would have to go back. Or the son that was telling the story, who's grown now, said, or would we? Because they don't know where we are. Maybe we're free from forever. But the dad says, we gave them our word. And so they traveled back in the communism. They got home and the phone rang. Somebody didn't identify themselves and they said, are you so-and-so? And the dad says, yes. And he said, you're back in the country. And he said, yes. You called this number. He said, are all of your family with you? And he said, yes. On the other end, that said, thank God. Click. Right. Years later, they found out that there was a high official that came in uh, to that building and uh, that he had heard the dad, I think, preach a funeral of someone. And the message just stuck with him. So he came in and he said, well, if they say they will come back, they will come back. So he got it approved. He just walked by. He saw the name on the desk there. It wasn't even going to be sent anywhere. They were just going to put it in the shredder. And he saw it on the desk, and he took the paperwork, and he got it approved for this family to escape and to go back. Well, it wasn't long after that that uh, an American president came over and visited the country, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, there was a little bit of hope. There was a glimmer of hope. Well, it's said, oh, God's wondrous works are beginning to happen. But uh, Mr. Gorbachev was willing to tear down the wall, but not the one that was in authority right there where they were in their part of the town. But the people became emboldened, the Christians that had been in fear all this time began to come out into the streets. And they didn't do anything violent. They just came out with candles and prayers. And after a month, they were allowed, the wall did come down. And they were allowed to go to freedom. Well, see, those folks never expected that they would be in any type of captivity. They came to them. There were a lot of Christians during that time. There are a lot of Christians all over the world today that are facing all kinds of captivity and oppressiveness upon them being Christians. So, in Jeremiah's case, it was the way of life was you go in and you give up. And that's really pessimistic to us that like to win, right? But that's, that's just how it was. And the judgment of God was coming upon them because they had sinned and would not turn back to God. And our nation in a lot of areas, in a lot of ways, has turned its back on God. And I, we don't know whether it's too late or not. <laughs> hopefully it's not. And hopefully there will be a great turnaround. But there may not be a turnaround. If there's not, then we're still going to have to serve God just like those oppressed people did. And we're going to have to keep our word just like that dad did. And we're going to have to live for God in a difficult way if that comes about. Now let's go to that more general thing there. I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And that comes to us in the spiritual area. There is the way of life and there is the way of death. And if we will repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in the Lord, we can accept the way of life. We can step into the way of life. Now, in this general area, that's a good thing. It's not like giving up to the oppressors. This is just giving yourself to God, good God, who will help us at the end of our lives. And I think about 
as we celebrate the life of our dear sister Melba, and I kept calling Melba Shelby uh, all day yesterday. I knew who it was, but Shelby standing right beside me. I just kept calling the name Shelby. But as you think about this, uh, there there's five characteristics of Melba that I, since most of you were not able to be there, I just want to call our attention to that and just honor her and the memory of her Lord also again today. And uh, so you had those characteristics. The first one was bubbly. <laughs> she was cheerful. And uh, her brother actually described her as being bubbly. Now I always thought of her having this little smile and this little chuckle. And uh, Shelby always enjoyed aggravating her. And then we understand that she liked the Golden Girls. She, she had their videos and she had a shirt of them. And she had even said, don't wear black. And I forgot the, that part whenever I mentioned it yesterday. She said, don't wear black. Now, of course, not everybody got the memo at the uh, funeral there. But what she was saying was, I'm going to go on. I'm, you know, I'll be okay. I'll be happy. So she was cheerful. And then she was determined. And she was hard-headed, not here. And they had to fight to get her to go to the hospital. And she was industrious. She lived in Chicago for 20 years. She worked as a teacher's aide. She worked for a nursing home. She became a supervisor of the dietary department. And then she was caring. She helped to raise some of her cousin's kids. And, and uh, her brother had to call them every day to let them know he was OK. And then she and Shelby helped take care of Byford and Lewis. And the first characteristic was she was loved. She was loved by her family and her friends. But most of all, this is what I want to get to, she was loved by her Savior. Mm -hmm. So you had those five characteristics, and there were five truths that she knew. And these five truths has to do with the way that is set before us. There is the way of life, or there is the way of death. A lot of people think that you have to work your way into the way of life, but that's not how it is. Here's what Melba knew. She knew that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. She also knew some of the bad news. The bad news is that we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Two aspects of the bad news. The good news, God loves us. We've all sinned. The bad news is the wages of sin is death. And spiritual life, spiritual death. Spiritual death is also known as hell. Two other truths. The gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And she knew that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. And she knew that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And she did that at some point in her life. And so the way is before us. It's the way of life or the way of death. Which do you choose? You say, well, I won't choose. That's a choice. So if you don't choose the way of life, you've chosen the way of death. But the good news is that even if we were to have bad circumstances, bad, bad, bad external circumstances, that we can have a relationship with God in the dollar. You can have a peace that passes understanding. You can have a strength that you don't have within yourself. And you can have a strength to be able to stand. You can have a strength that would empower the people that had escaped to freedom to keep their promise and go back in to oppression. Have the strength to do that. The way is before us. 
Which one of your hands will it be for you? Hope you choose life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. And I do thank you for your blessings. And Lord, I thank you for uh, these promises that you have given to us. And Lord, that even though we've sinned, we have a great and wonderful Savior who loves us. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your Son. And Lord, I thank you that whenever he went to the cross, they didn't take his life from him, that he laid it down willingly. He willingly gave himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And Lord, if we will confess our sins and put our faith and trust completely in you, that you will do the wondrous works of salvation within our life. And we thank you for it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never accepted the Lord, I'd invite you to come to this altar and call upon him. And the altar is always open here. If you have a prayer need, we invite you to do that too. If you would stand with us as we sing, if you're able to stand, that would be great. Praise him.